Hey everybody, we just did our uh, next installment of Jewish Intimacy based on the Ramban. Now you see the title, Don't Give Your Strength to Women. If you're a feminist, don't worry. We're not uh, bashing women or anything like that. We're just simply teaching you some ways that a person can help themselves or hurt themselves. Same exact action. Is it good? Is it healthy to be intimate often, whether it's with your wife? Otherwise, of course, we understand the spiritual aspect of the sins. But here we're going to talk about the physical aspect of it, the health aspect of it, the life aspect of it. Is it worth it for you to be frequently intimate with someone, with yourself, or even with your wife? The Rambam, the Ramban, the Bala Tulim, and even the Holy Yosef Tzadik come and teach us whether it's worth it or not, the benefits, the downside, the upside, and what does Shabbat have to do with all of it? A lot of interesting stuff. Enjoy it, share it, if you can, support it, but most importantly, be holy. We're back here on our Tuesday night series about Jewish intimacy based on the Holy Sefer Yigeret HaKodesh by the Ramban, Nachmanides. And uh, tonight's shiur will be for the uh, Refua Shlema for Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit uh, Levana Bat Sarah, Rabbi Mori David Ben Esriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora. And also for the Atzlacha uh, Rabbah, for uh, Marsha Bat Julie and all of Am Yisrael, and all the righteous Noahais that continue to support us and help us with all of the amazing things that uh, the organization is doing, Baruch Hashem. Uh, just to remind everybody, we uh, tonight is the last day of the um, Gregorian calendar month, and uh, after tonight we'll be uh, picking a uh, winner of the campaign of the Donors to the Gano movie. Uh, to help us uh, market this uh, this monumental movie, to produce USBs and other different things. So anyone that donates even tonight on uh, the website genome.org uh, can enter the uh, and win the campaign. And the winner of it uh, will have a uh, uh, either uh, um, the collection of uh, USBs that we have, uh, $500 value, or one of the uh, brand new uh, taliot with a atara, also is a $500 value, Bezot Hashem after tonight will pick it. Uh, I know the last uh, few winners, Bo Hashem, are very happy with what they got, Bo Hashem. Uh, so uh, also as a reminder for everybody uh, that um, wants to do Q, right now we're at the time of Shuvavim. Uh, as I mentioned to you guys the other day, go to the Kiruv store, get yourself some free cards to uh, give out in your community. This is the new Tikkun Abrit uh, cards. Uh, people can, uh, you know, watch this um, film and actually uh, do tshuva, do tshuva for, uh, for Tikkun Abrit, which is uh, by far the uh, most foundational part of tshuva, because once a person protects their brit, they're going to have strength to do a lot of other things, which has a lot to do with our uh, shield tonight. Now, I know that uh, right now there is a, um, as a, you know, custom uh, to uh, start reading Parashat Haman, uh, where uh, you know you read the section of this week's parasha, Parashat B'Shalach, a section about talk discussing the manna bread, and uh, this is a skula that uh, this is very good for parnasa. Uh, generally speaking, it's good to read that parasha all year round. Uh, but uh, one thing that uh, I would say is also uh, uh, good to hear from you know to, to learn from that Parashat Haman is uh, something that uh, will achieve a lot more than just good parnasa, but actually good life. When you see that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, is, you know, gets Am Yisrael in his face pretty much, you know, complaining about everything and, you know, why are you starving us? Why are you uh, making us uh, not have food, not have drink, not have this, not have that? And instead of, you know, getting angry at them, instead of... Uh, uh, rebuking them, uh, which is something that he did later on because they literally took it too far. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu uh, 
uh, cries out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but at the same token, later on, he says to Am Yisrael, you complained against Hashem. You're not complaining against me or Aaron. You're complaining against Hashem. Ve'anachnuma. We are nothing. We're nothing that you're going to complain against us. We're, we're a creation. We're not the creator. So this is something that we've all heard before as far as Ve'anachnuma. Uh, that we are nothing, and we've heard the humility of Moshe Rabenu. But uh, I thought that it's a uh, a good thing to uh, to learn how such a behavior is uh, is practiced in real life, in uh, you know, in, in not just uh, something that happened three thousand three hundred thirty four years ago. And I uh, read a story that uh, with my kids that uh, certainly emulates what Vanachnuma. Uh, is uh, in real life, and I think this is a perfect, uh, uh, you know, st- way to start the shield because anyone that understands this particular point will have a much easier time understanding the rest of the shiul, and quite frankly, all of the shiulim that we have uh, that give the truth that sometimes uh, contradicts a person's predisposition, a person's opinion. Uh, like someone told me yesterday, or at least tried to tell me yesterday, about all of his ideas of what God should do. And he was surprised at the response that I gave him, who do you think you are, that you're going to tell God what to do? You know, he's giving God ideas of what he thinks he should do with the Yetzirah, what he thinks he should do with this, with anti-Semitism, with Gehenom, with this. And I'm like, who do you think you are? You can't even tell your own wife what to do. You can't tell the IRS what to do. You can't tell the government what to do. You can't even tell the clerk at the, uh, at the gas station what to do and them for sure listen to you. You're going to tell God what to do. And of course, this, the, the, if a person has an ego, they're not going to let that real truth enter their mind, enter their heart, and realize, okay, you know what, maybe I need to check myself, maybe I really do need to uh, do tshuva, maybe I really do need to reevaluate what my opinions are, what my beliefs are. And when you hear something as far as Moshe Rabbeinu saying, I am nothing, it's very hard to understand. So we read this story and certainly got a extraordinary uh, uh, teachings from our G'dolei Ador, from just the previous generation. We're not talking about, you know, 3,000 years ago. We're talking about grandparents' age. And uh, certainly uh, uh, one of the uh, greatest stories uh, that a person could hear and, and apply to their life. At the time uh, of uh, when uh, Rav Shmuel Vosnel uh, was still a, a young man, a Gedol Torah, giant, uh, you know, was a uh, favored in the eyes of the uh, Chazonish who worked hard in his beautiful, holy way to make sure that Rav Vosnel uh, became a Gedol Torah in the eyes of the public uh, by standing up for him, even though he was much older than him, but standing up for him and telling him, you know, you can't walk alone, I have to take you, I have to go with you. Uh, because someone that's a Gdol Ador cannot walk by himself. Just imagine the Chazonish is uh, walking next to a Rav Oznel. Why? Because he's a Gadol Batorah. Needless to say, what is the Chazonish? Anyway, when uh, the uh, Rav Shmuel Voznel, Allah uh, Shalom, was still younger, and uh, at the time there was an extraordinary poverty. Today, you know, poverty to most people is they can't get themselves a second car or they can't go on the Pesach vacation that they want to go to. That's sometimes poverty to some people. In other cases, poverty is missing, you know, not having the ability to pay your rent on time. But from this story, we certainly, my, my kids and I, uh, uh, you know, and, and wife were shocked at uh, like true poverty uh, being detailed in just a simple word. At the time, it was Pesach and uh, the poverty was so bad that uh, Rav uh, Yechezkel Levinstein, uh, Allah wa Shalom, uh, you know, was only able to afford one chicken for the entire Chag, for, for his whole family, for seven days. Okay? One chicken. We're not talking about one chicken per person, one chicken per, uh, per day. We're talking about the entire holiday. All they have to eat is one chicken. Today, you make a, uh, you know, a lunch order with a, uh, you know, and quickly you have five, ten chicken sandwiches for you and your friends and your family. That in itself is already more than what they ate the entire holiday. But here, one of the G'dolei Torah, Rav Levinstein, only has one chicken uh, to, uh, to eat for the entire holiday. But in those days, the chickens didn't come like they do here in the, in the States and in, 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 uh, in most of the world. Uh, where there's kosher markets, where it's all prepared and cut and beautiful. 
uh, they literally had the chicken, you know, slaughtered, and uh, you had to, the wives typically had to take out the feathers and then rip it up and then make sure to check the chicken to see that it's kosher. Uh, and uh, as soon as the tzaddika, the rabbinit Levinstein, opened up the chicken, she saw that there's a sheila, there's a questionable uh, issue here with this chicken. Of course, this also shows you of the level of knowledge of the tzaddikot of the previous generation where they were able to literally investigate the the, the lungs and the uh, uh, the different body parts of the uh, the chickens and the uh, different animals they would eat in order to determine if they're kosher or not and had the uh, level of Yirat Shemaim that if they knew that there's a question, they wouldn't eat it. Now what about the fact when you only have one chicken for the whole family for an entire holiday because the poverty is running rampant? A question is a question and therefore it must be answered or else we're not going to eat anything. So, she, of course, she brings it to her husband, Rabbi Cheske Levinstein. He's the Gdol Adol. She gives it to her husband. Her husband looks into it and he says, this is a very complicated question. And uh, I, uh, I'd rather send it to Rav Shmuel Vosnel. And he gives it to his uh, Talmud, go bring this chicken to Rav Shmuel Vosnel and have him paskin whether this chicken is kosher or not. So, the Talmud brings the chicken over to Rav Vosnel. Rav Vosnel quickly looks at it and sees the complication and he says to the Talmud tell Rav Levinstein that for an average person this chicken is kosher but for an Adam Gadol a giant person like yourself holy person like yourself you should not be eating it and he return gives him the chicken back so the Talmud runs back gives the chicken to Rav Levinstein and tells him exactly word for word what Rav Vosnel said and to the Talmud's surprise, Rav Levinstein is unhappy with the answer. Not because of the Psak, but how he arrived at the Psak. And he asked the Talmud, go back to Rav Voznel and at, with the chicken and ask him, how do you know that I am an Adam Gadol? That I'm, a, you know, big in the Torah, I'm a big chacha. How, how do you know such a things? Because I know that uh you know i'm nothing i'm dust and ashes but maybe you know more about what i know in the torah that i don't know so perhaps you can tell me how you think i'm adam gadol now of course the talmid who knows his rabbi is the gadol adol is confused like for the rab why 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 he's gonna ask why he says because my kids are hungry and i too am obligated to eat meat on the holiday so if he determined that I'm an Adam Gadol because people say I'm an Adam Gadol, then that's nothing. People say a lot of things. We don't have to listen to such a thing. and Therefore, we can eat the chicken. But if he has some proof that I'm really an Adam Gadol, which I don't know where he would find it because I don't, I'm a nothing, then, uh, then I can't eat the chicken. Of course, the bewildered Talmud runs to Rav Vosnel, and tells him exactly word for word what his Rebbe told him. And as soon as Rav Vosna hears this, tears fill his eyes at the humility of Rav Levinstein. How this giant literally believes that he's zero, that he's dust and ashes. And he takes the chicken and he throws it in the garbage. And he says to the Talmud, just wait one second. He goes to his refrigerator and digging around a little bit, he grabs a chicken and he gives it to, Arav, to, to, to the Talmud and he says to the Talmud, tell Arav Levinstein that on second thought, he's right, the chicken is kosher. The chicken is kosher, I retracted my psak, the chicken is kosher, he can eat it, no problem. He didn't tell him he changed it. He told him, here's the chicken, he can eat this because he knew that this giant is not going to accept this free chicken. And then what do you have? At uh, the same token, you can't tell this Gdol Adol, he's not an Adam Gdol. What do you do? Tell him, I retracted. The chicken, this chicken is kosher. In essence, he's not lying because this chicken is kosher. The Talmud runs back to Rav Levinstein. And Rav Levinstein is happy. And Rav Vosner is happy. But the two are happy about two completely different things. 
Rav Ozner is happy that he was able to do chesed to one of the giants of the generation. And Rav Levinstein is happy that Rav Ozner paskint that he is not an Adam Gadol. When you have giants in Torah realize that they are nothing, yet they know more than, and literally in a day's lesson, what we would know in a lifetime, it behooves us to learn their Torah, to learn what these Chachamim learned, and to follow in their footsteps. And this is why when you listen to the Shiu tonight, you're going to have a completely different impression of Chazal's care about Am Yisrael and their well-being and their uh, you know joy in this world and also at the same token you may actually end up looking at intimacy differently not just because of the last 15 shirim told to you about the the sanctity of it but rather here today we're going to talk about more of the health aspects and if you just judge the book by its cover and determined that uh, the title of the shiu don't give women your strength or why not to give women your strength perhaps a chauvinist then you should know that this is actually a verse from Shlomo HaMelech and tonight we're going to learn why Shlomo HaMelech wrote this and it was actually originally said by his dear mother the Tzadikah Batsheva so the Ramban started chapter 3 the second path discussing the time of union when is the perfect time for a man to be intimate with his wife and of course he talked to us about how the average person it all depends on their job whether they are a person that uh, has a regular uh job that uh you know allows them to uh, be with his wife every single day because it's a let's say let's just call it an office job or he's very wealthy and he has pretty much uh no need to do a lot of hard work or he has the type of job that requires him uh, to uh, be with her only a few times a week because it requires, a, you know, the, the job uh, requires a lot more physical, uh, 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 you know, commitment. Or there are people that are traveling. They're traveling and they're not going to be with their wives for uh, more than once a week or even once a month or in one case, even once every six months. But he says, putting aside all of those people, we're going to talk about the intimacy of the Torah scholars, these giants, these tzaddikim, the ones that you've heard of and the ones you've never heard of, the ones that are sitting in our kolel in Yerushalayim and writing books and giving answers and giving shiurim that you may or may not have ever heard of and other places around the world that are toiling in Torah that you may or may not have ever heard of or the ones that you do hear about and you read their books. But these Torah scholars have a unique set of rules. And of course, anyone that wants to be special has to emulate people that are special. Anyone that wants to be successful has to emulate those that are successful. Even if you cannot reach their level, certainly aspiring to get there will get you to a better place than what you are today. So the Ramban says, these special people aside from the obligatory nights such as mikveh night or if right before they travel generally speaking the the uh, the time to be intimate is on shabbat once a week and they in essence they fast they fast from intimacy and other uh parts of the physical joy of the world throughout the entire week saving themselves for shabbat now last week we discussed the spiritual aspect of it why there's a significance to being intimate on Shabbat. Now, of course, if a person is at a level where they could be intimate, uh, you know, only once a week and their spouse is happy with it, certainly that is a, uh, an achievement. I wouldn't suggest a person start their marriage that way unless this is the way that they were brought up. This is their mindset already on day one and both them and their spouse agree to this. But needless to say, a, a person learned from last week that even if they're intimate during the rest of the week they should make sure to save their energy for shabbat because of the spiritual elevation of it but now the ramban takes a different turn where he starts talking to us about the the seed the seed of a person the 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 physical aspects the health aspects of it of whether a person is intimate often too often because in the world today unfortunately you have a lot of secular teachings that not only is a something that uh, uh, goes against the Torah but it literally contradicts logic if anybody actually understood 
the physical aspects of the human body. And that's one of the things that the Ramban is going to discuss today. And he's going to address the people that are married, the people that are single, the people that are promiscuous with themselves, the people that are promiscuous with others, and even the people that are very promiscuous even with their own, uh, their own spouse. Now again, promiscuity under the definition of marriage is obviously uh, very different than one that's outside of marriage, but needless to say, a person will understand the point, Bezal Hashem, at the end of this shiur. So the Ramban says, it's known that uh, David HaMelech tells us on, uh, in Psalm chapter 1, verse 3, bring forth its fruit in its season, meaning that if you want to get the best fruit, there's a specific time for it. And it's known that the seed of a man is the life of the body and the light of its glowing aura. It is the choicest and purest blood in the body, for if it would not so, the form, the tsua, which is the physical and spiritual essence of a person, would not be fashioned from it. See here, the Ramban, which was not only a Torah scholar, a Kabbalist, a doctor, uh, you know, he was a, a person of, of many, many abilities, is also giving us something that really the, uh, the secular world only found out in recent generations, where he's telling you that the seed is not only something that is relevant to the spiritual aspect of a person that is going to affect the person's aura, uh, whether this person is promiscuous or not, is easily uh, seen based on their spiritual, uh, if, if a person has spiritual vision, but even if a person does not have spiritual vision, after today you'll be able to also see uh, who is or who isn't promiscuous, and even if they're not now anymore, you could see pretty much what they were in their life. Now, I don't recommend you start looking at people and point at them and say, oh, this person uh, is, a, uh, is this or that, because again, there are many reasons for different things, but needless to say, a person should look in the mirror and see if his actions throughout his life or her life has left their marks. Now, one of the things that the Ramban is teaching us here is that the seed of a man is the choicest and purest blood in the body. So unlike the common thought that it's something separate, he's actually telling you that this is the purest part of the body, unlike the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and all the different things that are in the body, the ultimate, the ultimate product that a person has in their body is their seed. Because... If it were not the ultimate, then Hashem would not be able to use it, and would not use it, I should say, to create man. As Rabbi Ephraim says, if you want to make something good, you need the greatest ingredients. Hence the reason why the greatest ingredients in a person's body is their seed. Now, the seed, says the Ramban, is a portion of the parts of the body and it has a part of each member. It's known that an eye cannot be born of an ear or an ear be born of an eye. Rather, each organ or limb is drawn from the nature of what is familiar, similar to it. From the grain of wheat, there will not come forth beans and lentils. From the seed of man, there will not come a donkey or an ox or a lamb. Here he is elaborating further and making a promise in the name of the Torah that all of those six scientists that until this day, despite the legal ramifications in some countries that are still trying to take the seed of man and make all types of heretical uh, and, and simply wicked studies with it, to try to combine it with different animals to see if they could produce something new, the Ramban is already promising in the name of the Torah that will never succeed. The seed of man will never create a animal other than man. And unfortunately, this is one of the things that is not new in the world. This is something that has been tried and tested for many generations. Many wicked people preceded us. Needless to say, many weak, wicked people are among us. 
In many countries, this type of thing is illegal, uh, but that doesn't necessarily stop sick people from doing whatever sickness is in their mind. Of course, this is not only something that happens in the lab. This is also something that, uh, to many people's surprise, is a choice that people make due to their uh, perverted minds. Where, uh, as the Ramban says, uh, that, and also Rabbi Nachman Rebreslev, uh, Alava Shalom as well says, that uh, when a person is promiscuous with himself, uh, and they waste seed, and, uh, and, and, or if it's a woman, she, uh, she uh, uh, does the things to herself, what ends up happening is that this, at some point, becomes uh, not unsatisfactory, but simply unfulfilling. So they start becoming promiscuous with other people. And eventually, if they're still not controlling themselves, and they act like animals, even more so than they did on their own, then what they simply do is that they go to the next taboo, which is becoming promiscuous with multiple people. And when that's not enough, and uh, the promiscuity with multiple people and the perversion of the body and the mind is no longer enough, then they simply just try the next taboo, which is promiscuity with the same gender. Uh, the homosexuality is, is not a new perversion in the world. This is something that's uh, as old as time. The generation of Noah was destroyed as a result of homosexuality and promiscuity uh, with self and with others. Now, this type of behavior also doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there, as we see in the headlines. Uh, unfortunately, today, you know, it's the uh, the uh, the perversion of uh, of people is not uh, something that people can contain to simply hurt themselves and somebody that's willing. It also leads to people that are becoming uh, victims to them, whether it is rape or pedophilia. If you notice one common denominator among all of the pedophiles, they're all homosexuals. This is not a homophobia. This is simply a reality. Whether it's that sick couple that was recently exposed and arrested and Bezat Hashem, Uh, will get the heaviest punishment that any government could ever give them, uh, that adopted two children from a Christian uh, uh, adoption agency just to rape these kids for a period of years and actually sell them off to their sick friends, uh, uh, you know, to also commit pedophilia with these two poor kids. Now, this is obviously two homosexual guys that somehow uh, uh, the, the, the Satan convinced the, uh, the, uh, the Christian adoption center to allow these homosexuals to adopt two kids without checking on them, without doing anything, just simply because they were very wealthy, and uh, only to find out several years later that the damage, the trauma that these kids went uh, under uh, is, is simply, uh, you know, something that uh, you can never even imagine, even in, in the worst nightmares. Now, of course, this pedophilia is not the first thing. If these guys were able to, 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 to hand off these kids uh, to other people, needless to say, there are other people that are doing the same exact thing. And one common denominator about these pedophiles is that they're all homosexuals. That's just a real fact. Now, one of the things that uh, uh, you'll see the, the, the lefty liberals... Uh, and the people that are pro-homosexuality do, is like, no, no, but I know my friend, he is homosexual, she's homosexual, but they're not a pedophile. They'll, you know, they'll give you the the exceptions or the exclusions and all that stuff. The reality is, is that if you look at what's happening in society, the perversion of the mind has gotten to a point where it's destroying society. And it's across the whole world. Of course, there's much more damage happening in the States than in many other places, but there is, needless to say, a lot of damage happening in other places. Like, for example, in the issues of bestiality, there was a study that was done years ago in, uh, in, in the United States, maybe about 10 years ago or so, that uh, said that they uh, uh, estimate that at least 1% of the American public admits to committing bestiality with dogs and all types of other animals, Hashem Yishmo. Now, if you think that's bad, you could simply go to other countries and see that it's actually worse in some cases. So much so that, for example, in Brazil, the uh, it's it's a it's a custom, it's a custom among the perverted sick people that uh, you know they uh, need to practice on uh, on different animals. 
and uh, of course the Ramban says that these types of things these types of bestialities will not only never yield any fruit but if the Torah says it's forbidden that means it'll create damage and in fact one of the uh, studies confirmed that the highest rate of erectile dysfunction and cancer in the male member is actually in Brazil which is also uh coincidentally uh the one that also is uh, most uh, uh highest rate of bestiality because it's literally a uh, uh an acceptable behavior now if you vomited already at this point I promise to try to minimize the rest of the vomiting for the rest of the shoe but there's a point here it's an important point here that if the Torah tells you that something is not good it's not telling you it's not good because God profits as a result of you listening to him it's telling you it's not good because it's not good for you it's not good for your family it's not good for your friends it's not good for society and certainly it's not good for anyone that's involved whether they are a partner or a victim of the craziness of people so when the Torah tells you that the seed of man will never yield a donkey or an ox or a lamb and it's simply telling you nothing good will ever come out even if you determine that a donkey or a lamb is good even that won't come out from such a thing and this being so says the Ramban each limb and organ every form has its particular nature and power that stems from whence it's born now this particular statement is in essence telling us here that this seed that a man has has everything in it your arms your legs your eyes your hair your 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 teeth the shape of your face everything is in that seed now this seed on a physical perspective has the physical parts but at the same token there are spiritual aspects of it we're going to discuss Bezat Hashem next week now when it comes to the seed of a person because of uh, of of the spiritual aspect of it this is the reason why a Jewish woman cannot go to some random uh, uh seed donor uh, because she doesn't want to get married this is completely forbidden but needless to say a person himself that is the donor on these things and thinking that he's doing a mitzvah should realize at this at some point tonight that not only are they not doing a mitzvah by wasting seed and saying no I'm not wasting it because it's eventually going to go to somebody not only are they not doing a mitzvah but they're actually causing an extraordinary damage to themselves as a result of that action even if that action looks like it's a good action looks like it's a uh, helping people because that particular seed has each part of you in it each part of the potential of somebody else in it that is the only thing that could come out of this thing now the next statement that the Ramban makes crushes those that want to believe in evolution and Darwin's theory or any of the heretics that stemmed from him that still follow this proven false theory of evolution and how we came from monkeys and and all types of nonsense where he says the following do not be taken back in a blind man being able to give birth to a seeing person for the power of an organ of for the power of the organ is found in the general nature of the body and therefore since the seed is part of each of the respective limbs and organs of the body it's not fitting for a man to be constantly with his wife like a rooster for then his strength will lessen his eyes grow dimmer and all the organs of his body will deteriorate so here the Ramban is telling us something truly powerful where he's first and foremost telling us if you notice blind people have kids and those kids can see deaf people have kids and those kids can hear when the reformers came to yeshivat volozin at the time of the enlightenment a couple of hundred years ago they were very very smart people and they wanted to debate the torah scholars in the yeshiva 
saying that no, we have proof and evidence that we came from monkeys. So of course the Torah scholars are smarter than all. They have the wisdom of the Torah. All seven wisdoms are found in the Torah. And I told them, well, if you came from monkeys, where's your tail? I told them, no, no, but you don't understand. We came from monkeys, but since at some point we didn't need those tails, therefore the, the body shed them. So of course the Chachamim from Yeshivat Volozhin says, okay, fine, let's say you didn't need them, you didn't need the tail, and it's gone, you shed it. Like, you know, the uh, snake sheds his skin, and the uh, deer sheds his antlers. You shed the tail, fine. But where's the genes for it? Because even if you shed it, there still has to be different parts of the body different genes within the body that are still connected to that same tail. Where is that? You're never going to find it. Because that is already, if that exists, that doesn't go away. If that was in the original seed at some point, it doesn't go away. That seed of the amoeba doesn't go away. The seed of the monkey, the seed of, the, uh, of anything else that you say you've evolved from, all has to be in it. Where is all of that? And of course, this is where the world of Darwin and uh, evolution goes on its face without an answer. Because there is no answer that has any relevance to truth or even intellect. Now, when a person looks at it that way, they could also look at it from a religious perspective. Because they say, listen... I don't know anybody blind, so I don't know what kind of kids they have. Or maybe the, uh, the mother affected him, maybe this, maybe that. There's another very simple proof that every Jewish father can see, that even if you had 15 kids, all 15 are boys. And all 15 boys, on the eighth day, assuming everyone is healthy, Baruch Hashem, you do the Brit Mila. You have kid number 16. Kid number 16 is still born with the Orla requiring the Brit Mila. Meaning it doesn't matter that we've been doing a Brit Mila since the time of Avraham Avinu. People are not born circumcised. Why? Because again, the what happens to the body after the fact, doesn't necessarily change the seed. Doesn't change that. Hence another proof that throws evolution on its face. And this is what the Ramban is telling us, that you need to know as a prerequisite knowledge in order to understand the key point here. If you understand that the seed that you have in your body has so much power in it, the power to give somebody vision, the power to give somebody life, the power to give somebody that's alive, the ability to hear, to walk, to touch, to taste, to speak. Everything is in that seed. This seed is something you want to make sure is as perfect as it gets. Why? Because nobody wants the kids that have problems. What is it like? If somebody told you, listen, you're hungry? Sure, I'm hungry. Well, I have three possibilities for you. One is a steak. Two is chicken. And three is a meatball. But before you decide, I want to show you them. And he shows you steak, chicken, and a meatball. Steak, you look at it. It looks greenish. This is from today. No, no, not from today. Where is it from? I have no idea. Why is it green? The food coloring or something? Uh, no, I wouldn't call it the food coloring. Okay, okay, let me pass. You look at the chicken. Chicken. You're not really sure if it's alive, if it's dead. All types of interesting colors. All types of things that look like maybe it has an abscess or two. Perhaps you could send it for a surgery. 
Okay, I'll pass him a chicken. And then you look at the meatball. From the outside, the meatball uh, looks fine, but after seeing the chicken and the uh, and the meat, you're like, what kind of meatball is it? Oh, because this is a uh, this is a godly meatball. A what? A godly meatball. What's a godly meatball? Only God knows what's in that meatball. That's we have no idea. Okay, okay. You know what? I'm not hungry anymore. What do you mean? You just said you don't. You sure? No, no, no. I'm not hungry anymore. Why? Because before anybody consumes anything, on the normal conditions, they want to make sure that that meal is perfect. I'm not going to eat a green steak. I'm not going to eat a chicken that looks like maybe it's going to walk away while I'm eating it. Maybe it's going to say "ow." And I'm certainly not going to eat a piece of meat that nobody even knows where it came from. I want something perfect. Needless to say, before I consume it, I want to make sure that it's perfect. And needless to say, times a million, before a child comes into the world, every single parent wants to make sure that they will do everything possible to make sure that that child comes out perfect. That if somebody would tell them, listen, if you want your kid to be perfect, to have the ability to see, to have the ability to speak, to have the teeth, to have ear, da, 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 you want this? You have to jump five times every day. You'll see every single parent, eight billion people in the world jumping five times a day. Why? Why are you jumping? Oh, I want a good kids. So you jump? Yeah. Why? It's a small price to avoid uh, all the problems. See, here the Ramban is telling you if you want your children to be perfect, first and foremost, protect the source. Protect the, what's going to make that kid physically. Not just, we're not even getting to the spiritual aspect of it, which we've covered extensively and we'll cover more, even more so. We're talking about first and foremost, the physical aspect of it. Make sure that seed is as perfect as can possibly be. Because if you do anything to damage that seed, you can be sure that you will live a life of regret. Genom will already begin for you in this world. Now a person says, okay, fine, but what can I do to hurt it? The Ramban says, promiscuity, either with self, with others, or even being with your wife too often can hurt it. And can hurt you. Why? He says, since we now understand that the power of the organ is found in the general nature of the body, that every single organ, the power for it, is in that seed. Therefore, the seed is part of each and every respective limb and organ in the body. And therefore, it's not fitting for a man to be constantly with his wife like a rooster. Where does he get this term rooster? A chicken lays an egg every day. That means that the rooster is able to be with it every day. But you're not a rooster. You can't be intimate every day. Not with yourself and not with others. Because you're not a rooster. In fact, the Gemara in the Masechet Brachot, page 22a, says that one of the takanot that Ezra instituted is that men at that time, every time they were together with their wives, they had to go dip in a mikveh. The men had to go dip in a mikveh after they were intimate with their wife. This is Tevilat Keri, it's called. Dipping of Keri. Now, this was later on canceled because it was a takana. It wasn't a, uh, a biblical obligation because uh, they saw that uh, simply the, the generation wasn't able to do it. People would simply either just not be intimate with their wives or they would just forsake the law and then it becomes a sin because it's, you know, at that, once it's the takana and you have to do it and you have to follow what the Chachamim say. So why add sins to the generation? But why would you add such a takana? Why would you add such a stringency of obligating every man to go to the mikveh after he's together with his wife? 
the Gemara says that was to protect the Torah scholars protect them from turning into roosters and being with their wives every day because if they became someone that's like a rooster certainly their scholarship will be thrown into the garbage not just because they'll constantly think about their wife and intimacy and all that other stuff but because they're not gonna have the physical strength since so much is in that seed and that's actually the next point that the Ramban covers Quoting from the Rambam in Ilchot Deo, chapter 4, verse 19, uh, uh, Alachan number 19, we says that if a man is like a rooster with his wife, then his strength will lessen, his eyes will grow dimmer, and all the organs in his body will deteriorate. Now, this is not a new chidush by the Ramban, but rather this is the Rambam, Ramban quoting the Rambam. This is actually a psak alacha. This is one of the teachings that's fundamental to our Torah that the Rambam elaborates further on. In Ilchot Deot, chapter 4, alacha number 19, the Rambam, Maimonides, who was an expert doctor, philosopher, Torah scholar, sage, where a Jew cannot walk right or left in a with knowing knowing that he's going in the right direction without knowing the Rambam because the vast majority of the Shulchan Aruch is the Rambam and from Moshe Rabenu until Moshe ben Maimon the Rambam there was nobody else like Moshe so a person that knows Rambam knows how to live like a Jew even though Paskin like the Shulchan Aruch and, and many uh, 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 still the vast majority over 90% of Shulchan Aruch is the Rambam but the Shulchan Aruch didn't cover as much ground as the Rambam and therefore anywhere that the Shulchan Aruch doesn't cover we pass him based on the Rambam automatically now of course there are different Chachamim different Rishonim that elaborate on this further but needless to say the Rambam is something that a person needs to know and the Rambam did not just cover whether something is kosher or not kosher whether you have to uh, uh, do this or do that but he's also giving us how to live and he says the following the semen is the strength of the body its life force and the light of the eyes the more frequent the emission of sperm the greater the damage to the body to its strength and the greater the loss to the one's lifespan here the Rambam is telling us that if a person is constantly wasting seed this will actually shorten their life but in the process it'll also make them sick now of course I know that many people are saying wait a minute but there's all types of people that uh you know they have a new uh girlfriend boyfriend or or donkey every other day they're looking like they're uh healthy uh, healthier than uh, anyone else give it time give it time and you'll see as you get older all those good looking people you end up seeing them look like some uh some person in a nursing care by the time they're in their 40s and 50s I've been young and I've aged a little bit and I've seen a lot of the guys and girls that uh, you know we grew up with in the neighborhood and you see these beautiful people that every other day they would celebrate about having all of these relationships all of these promiscuities and you see them 20 30 years later You're like what happened and you get hit by a truck and we're not talking about just normal aging everybody ages everybody gets uglier and uglier as the ages let's just call it that way but the reality is that there is normal aging and then it's like what happened and every one of us that's at least in their 40s or 50s knows that to be true why you've seen somebody like that you've seen one of your former classmates your best friend or somebody that was even a neighbor 
20, 30 years later, and you can't believe what happened to this person. They have more wrinkles than somebody in a nursing home. They have no teeth. Their eyes, you're not even sure if they can see or not. And many times, if it wasn't for the plastic surgeons and all of the things that money can buy to, you know, put a veil over people's eyes, these people literally, you would put them in a nursing home, would not feel bad. People question, oh, how come I'm losing my hair? Oh, how come I'm losing my teeth? I always brush my teeth. How come I'm losing my teeth? I always took care of my hair with the best shampoos, $50 at a clip but I'm losing my hair. Is it because of stress? It could be, but most likely it's because of something else. And sometimes you even see this on young people. People in their teens, 20s. I've seen some horrible cases because I deal with this and try to help a lot of people and you see literally certain people, they look like they're 50, 60 years old, they're 21, 20, 19. You see people, literally, they look sick. They look like they have AIDS. But they're perfectly healthy according to the blood test. What is this from? This is wasting their seed. Promiscuity. This, by the way, also affects women. Now, anyone that sees how some of the so-called celebrities that are on the, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not even a uh, frowned upon to be promiscuous in Hollywood because it's, in, quite frankly, it's frowned upon if you're not promiscuous. For a person to have five wives, that uh, apparently seems like it's a prerequisite to be a celebrity these days. But you see how they age? You see how they are when they're off the camera? One after another, looking like a tragedy. And it's not normal aging because you can see regular blue collar people, regular people without any plastic surgery, age normally, look normal, and you're not even sure how this and this are part of the same species. So the Rambam already gives us this clarification by letting us know that the frequent emission of sperm causes a great damage to the body is strength and a greater loss to one's lifespan. This was implied by Shlomo Amelech in his wisdom. Do not give your strength to women. Proverbs chapter 31 verse 3, which we'll get to in a moment. To elaborate further on what Shlomo Amelech said. Don't give your strength to women, meaning your seed to women. Whoever is steeped in sexual relations, says the Rambam, old age springs upon him before its time. His strength is depleted. His eyes become dim. He had perfect vision at 18. By the time he's 21, he needs glasses. By the time he's 22, the glasses have to get worse and worse and worse. Foul odor emanates from his mouth. And his armpits, the hair of his head, falls off, thins. His eyebrows, his eyelashes fall out. The hair of his beard, armpits, and legs grows in abundance. His teeth fall out, and he suffers many pains beyond these. Now, of course, he's not saying that all of these things will happen to one person. But certainly, these are the types of things that happen to a person. It could be one of them, two of them, all of them. Depends on the case, depends on the decree in Shemaim. And I remember when I first taught this, probably eight years ago, nine years ago, in our uh, big lecture of uh, Wasting Seed, the people in the crowd were shocked, and the people online that watched it were even more shocked. Because every single person watching it could relate to at least one of the different health issues that the Rambam and some of the other Chachamim that I mentioned in that shiur mentioned. Person is unsure why he wakes up in the morning and he already smells bad. I went to sleep. What could possibly happen while you're sleeping? Why do I smell bad? 
or he loses his hair. All of a sudden, he starts growing hair in strange places. Or even without having a problem with the tooth, he's not a sweets eater. His teeth start weakening. He bites an apple and the tooth breaks. These are the type of things that happen, not just from smoking, not just from a bad diet, but even more so from wasting seed. The wise of the doctors have said, says the Rambam, one of a thousand dies from other illnesses and a thousand from excessive intercourse. And therefore a person must take care in this matter if he wishes to live in good health, he should not engage in intercourse except when the body is healthy and particularly strong. When he has many involuntary erections, the erection is still present even when he makes an effort to think of something else. He finds a heaviness from the loins and below. The tendons of the testicles seem to be stretched and his flesh is warm. Such a person needs to engage in intercourse and it's medically advisable. This, of course, is referring to somebody that is married, not somebody that's single and has these feelings. But the point being is, is that he's already telling us that intimacy is not something that should be done just because you have an urge. Furthermore, the Rambam finalizes this specific halakha and he says he should not engage in intercourse on a full or empty stomach, but, but after the food has been digested. This actually the Ramban also elaborates on later on in Yigeret Ramban and how it has a, uh, uh, an impact, not just a health impact, but also a spiritual impact as far as when to eat relevant to when to be intimate. What to eat even he talks about. He should examine himself to see if he needs to move his bowels before and after intercourse. He should not engage in intercourse while standing or sitting, nor in the bathhouse, nor on a day on which he goes to the bathhouse, nor on a day on which he lets blood. In those days, they used to let blood. Nor on a day he parts on a journey or arrives from a journey, nor on a day before or afterwards. See here the Rambam is telling us that a person has to be very particular about the time he's intimate, the frequency of intimacy, not just for spiritual reasons, but for health reasons. Here is just another example of how much the sages of Am Yisrael cared about the well-being and the joy of Am Yisrael. Where technically you could just simply tell them, allowed, not allowed, make everything just simple, clear like robots. But here he's telling you something above and beyond that the Torah also teaches. Why? Because the Torah is also for you to live. Not just live like a robot or some statue, but to even enjoy this life. But enjoy it in a permissible way. Now, how do you ruin that? Simply not listening. And then he makes a promise in the name of the Torah in the next Alakha. In Alakha number 20 in chapter 4 in Chod Deot, the Rambam says the following, Whoever conducts himself in the way which we have drawn up, I will guarantee that he will not become ill through his life, throughout his life until he reaches advanced age and dies. He will not need a doctor. His body will remain intact and healthy throughout his life. One may rely on this guarantee, one may rely on this guarantee unless his body was impaired from his birth or he was accustomed to one of the harmful habits from birth or should be should there be a plague or a drought in the world. Here the Rambam gives you a guarantee in the name of the Torah. The greatest doctor in the world cannot give you a guarantee of anything. But the Rambam can, because he's not giving you a personal guarantee. He's giving you a guarantee according to the Torah. Somebody asked me recently, is there some type of skula that I could avoid ever seeing a doctor? And there is. 
a couple of things. One, there is the sages teach that there is a skula to be protected from uh, having illnesses and not having the need to see doctors by having full kavana every single time you say the asher yatzal blessing after you relieve yourself now this may seem like an easy feat but in reality it's very difficult because asher yatzal is perhaps one of the most frequent frequently said blessings a person goes to the bathroom several times a day assuming they say the blessing each time what ends up happening is that you become accustomed to it it becomes robotic you do it really quickly without looking at anything and sometimes you forget even what you said what you didn't say but surely having kavana is the least of your concerns because you want to go on with your day therefore the sages said that if a person has full kavana in the blessing that means they're going to think about all of the true blessings and benefits they got just being able to relieve themselves without extraordinary pain just being able to consume food and only retain the good parts and excrete all the bad parts or the useless parts having such a digestive system having a god that creates about our well-being but also about our joy when a person understands the mechanics of their simple simply just their digestive system they have a million and a half reasons to say thank you to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. but since we say this blessing so often Chachamim said it's good for a person to read it rather than to recite it from memory this is why our organization Bezat Hashem several years ago started a campaign where we made these Bezat Hashem posters of the Asher Yatsar blessing both for Sephardi and Ashkenazi and these were Baruch Hashem very very well received in the public we gave out thousands upon thousands tens of thousands of them out for free uh, around the uh, the world and one of the suggestions that I suggested to this fellow and I would suggest to you guys if anybody wants to sponsor the next campaign that we could do the same thing to raise enough money so we could actually print another round of 50 or 100,000 or more of these posters and distribute them every year for free because to sell them on the website once in a blue moon somebody buys a few of them there's not enough action but to get them in front of people the greatest way to do it when it comes to Torah is give it to people's hand and it's free and it's a good product this is Baruch Hashem one of the secrets to the success of our organization all the stuff that we have Baruch Hashem is good products they look good they are good and they're free they're expensive things but they're given for free now anyone that wants to be part of something like that is welcome to do it why because this is not only something that is going to help a person take that mitzvah more seriously because they have in essence an ownership in it but also it's the second part that I told this young man which is that if a person wants to live a long life not necessarily avoid doctors but live a long life they need to make themselves needed by society and I don't mean needed because of there's some fashion designer I mean needed by Am Yisrael either because they're a Torah scholar that the world needs more of or they're a Torah teacher that helps people do tshuva or they invest in it they put a lot of money into the Torah world they help a lot of people do tshuva through their money where the more a person exerts themselves the more Hashem connects them to different people and causes that need them and the more you're needed in this world the more the merit of others will give you life where even if your merit ran out you were supposed to live 50 years but you've made yourself needed by different communities that are valuable in the eyes of Hashem different organizations different tzaddikim different torah scholars that you're financing every month they need those few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars you send them every month guess what that torah scholars merit those people that are going to do tshuva those people that already did tshuva that rabbi that's doing kiruv all of those things that kolel that yeshiva all of those things will come to your merit especially if it's significant if it's not just significant in money but uh, the uh, from from your perspective meaning you've made it a top priority in your life 
the more you made a, a priority in your life, the greater it looks like in the eyes of Hashem. Even if the maximum you could afford is, you know, your 20% of your salary is $100, still that's significant in the eyes of Hashem. But if you're giving ten thousand dollars, but you make a million, that's not significant at all. Why? Because not it's one percent. So the point being is, when a person makes themselves needed by Am Yisrael, where they've made themselves a repeated partner with Hashem and His Torah, that in itself can give a person a longer life. So we have the Sgula to avoid doctors, which is having kavanah for the Asher Yitzah. But also we have the school of making ourselves needed by investing in a campaign like this or a campaign of USBs or, or, or both or whatever it is, a person literally makes themselves needed and also they're uh, to have a long life and also they're putting themselves in a position where they can have the ability to avoid all doctors. But now the Ramban led us to the Rambam that is giving us an additional school much more difficult, but needless to say, another skula. Where the Rambam says, and we covered this more extensively in our shiur a few years ago called kosher intimacy, where he says, if a person conducts themselves in the ways that which he described here in Ilchot Deot, there's more details than what I just read, the Rambam guarantees that this person will never become sick throughout their entire life. This is not something that a regular person can make a promise on. Just think of it. If anybody followed what the Rambam said in his day and went to him as a doctor, he's the doctor. Obviously, this could cause this person to become a heretic. So the Rambam is not foolishly making a promise here. He's, he has receipts. He knows what he's talking about. And he's telling you, follow what I said, you're never going to go have to go see a doctor. And he already, of course, takes into account that if a person has some uh, other conditions and things like that, obviously these types of things cannot uh, uh, be guaranteed then. But nonetheless, even if a person is not able to achieve this guarantee because of whatever reason, certainly it shows you the clear benefits of being kosher, when it comes to intimacy, being holy when it comes to intimacy, protecting yourself from being promiscuous, protecting yourself from things that can cause you a lot of damage, some of it being the worst kind. Now, the Rambam mentioned the Pasuk that Shlomo Amelech said, Shlomo HaMelech says, Al titen l'anashim ha'chelecha. This is in Proverbs, chapter 31, verse 3. Now, Shlomo HaMelech was a person that was holy, it's a king selected by Kadosh Baruch Hu, and gifted with the greatest level of wisdom of any man, aside from Moshe Rabbeinu. The wisdom that Shlomo Melech had was unprecedented. Also, the power that he had was unprecedented. He was not only the king of Am Yisrael, he was the king over the animals, he was king over the demons. He, anyone that reads some of the Midrashim and different things that are written about Shlomo HaMelech in the Gemara and other places, literally will never have to see any fairy tale movie again. All the things you could possibly imagine and not imagine. Shlomo HaMelech saw it. Shlomo HaMelech witnessed it. But Shlomo HaMelech made a mistake where he thought that he can marry the princesses from all of the countries in order to have world peace and convert all of the nations and thereby bring the Mashiach. And he married a thousand women. Even though the Torah says for a king not to marry more than 18 women. 
Now, so for somebody like Shlomo Melech, as smart as he is, to marry a thousand women for that reason because you want to bring Mashiach, we can understand. What we can't understand yet is how can you, that you married a thousand women, say, don't give women your strength when your strength is referring to your seed. You're married to a thousand women. How can you say such a thing? In order to find that out, we have to go to the Midrash. The Midrash Rabbah, Parashat Naso, in the in tenth parasha, Parasha Yud, section four, says that on the inauguration of the Bet Migdash that Shlomo Amelech built, the that day was also a different celebration for Shlomo where he married the princess of Egypt. And unbeknownst to Shlomo, she was a very wicked woman who did not abandon her idolatry completely in her ways. But Shlomo in his holiness thought that he's achieving the ultimate purpose by adding this princess to the uh, list of wives that he had and he celebrated his wedding. The Midrash says that this Tehilim that we just read, Tehilim number 31, starts with the words of Lemuel, the king. Shlomo HaMelech, the Midrash says, is called Lemuel in this. Why Lemuel? Because by him marrying this woman, it was as if he cast the yoke of the kingdom of heaven from upon himself, as if to say, why do I need God? At that moment, Akadosh Baruch Hu contemplated destroying the world. Why? Because the celebration that they had for the inauguration of the Bet HaMikdash was not unharmed by the celebration of wedding that Shlomo Melech had for himself on the same day. Because even though he spent a fortune on the celebration of the Bet HaMikdash, still, everybody wanted to show honor to Shlomo Melech. He's the king after all. And this wicked woman, Paro's daughter, she wanted the seed of Shmuel. She wanted a child from, she wanted the seed of Shlomo, uh, Shlomo. She wanted a child from Shlomo. And she wanted to keep him in bed for as long as possible. And that night they got married. She made sure to put a uh, specific, um, type of tapestry on the ceiling of the room while he was sleeping that had precious stones and pearls that shone like stars and constellations. So anytime Shlomo Melech would wake up, he would see that there were stars and constellations and he would think it's still at night. And she kept him in bed for longer. This caused Shlomo Melech to wake up late. All of Amisai was waiting for Shlomo to open up the gates of the Bet HaMikdash so they could do the Korban, the Korban Tamid. But Shlomo Melech was still sleeping. And therefore the Tehilim says, the words of Lemuel the king, the prophecy with which his mother disciplined him. What does it mean his mother disciplined him, says the Midrash? Rabbi Yochanan says, Everyone was scared to wake up, Shlomo Melech, except his mother. She came to the room. Obviously, the princess was kicked out. And the queen, Batsheva, Shlomo's mother, ties Shlomo to the pole or some type of a column as if to whip him and starts rebuking him. saying everyone knows that your father was a God-fearing man but now that this is how you behave 
you marry this girl you marry these other one all this what you're doing you end up being late to the bit of mikdash they're gonna blame me and say oh your father was a tzaddik so surely the bad part from from him is from from the mother and i've gone over this in the previous shurim but i want to go into the next point that the that the midrash says after rebuking him with different details of how much she exerted herself and put effort and sacrifice in order to bring him to the world but sheva says to her son shlomo don't give your strength to women and your conduct to that which destroys kings meaning don't give your strength to women by pursuing this immoral behavior with them because women will carry off your mind if you're constantly with women whether that is women of the night the person that's with 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 prostitutes whether they're free or you have to pay for them is irrelevant many times a person doesn't realize that these women of the night can sometimes even be demons the kava yashar gives a story of somebody that was with a prostitute and only to realize that he was actually with a demon which created a lot of damage in his life needless to say a person that's promiscuous with different women and this is all relevant the opposite by the way men with with uh, you know women with men promiscuity with, with 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 them is going to cause you harm but even more so a person needs to realize it's not just with strange women or with your girlfriend even if she's your wife and even if she's permitted to you even then you have to contain yourself because each time you're together you're giving her your strength and if you're simply excessive you're going to lose your strength you're going to lose your health you're going to lose your life and Bacheva says to Shlomo HaMelech even before the health and the life is lost your joy of life will be lost why because when you're constantly with women your mind is constantly on that you can't think about Torah you can't think about work you can't think about anything other than women I remember when I was younger and on Wall Street the guys at the office literally if it wasn't chasing money it was chasing women and some of them were literally worse than dogs every day they would compete with who got more numbers more girls more this and I just always said to myself how do you maintain this I mean literally you have to like be like multiple people and they always laugh and and then you see later on in their lives what all of this promiscuity leads not a single one of them ended up in a good life divorce disease all types of adultery all types of problems not a single one of them had a joyful life you will never meet a promiscuous person that had a good life never the two are simply the opposite see here Shlomo Melech's tzadika mother Batsheva says don't give your strength to women because they'll carry it off that strength along with your mind and then she says an even stronger statement that's mentioned in Proverbs by Shlomo Melech, chapter 29 verse 3 zonot hon. the companion of zonot of harlots prostitutes will lose a fortune by saying to this don't conduct yourself in such a manner because it'll destroy you you will lose all of your money if you chase girls if you're promiscuous you could be sure that at some point you will also be broke because each time a person emits seed he is sharing the shefa, the spiritual sustenance that Kadosh Baruch Hu gives him. Now, if you are sharing that sustenance with your wife, she's yours. Sustenance stays under the same household. In fact, if it's 
kosher, intimate, and, and, and beautiful, it actually creates blessing. The seed of the husband going into the wife in a kosher way does a lot of wonderful things for the marriage. It calms the, 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 the wife uh, uh, spiritually. It makes her uh, happier. It makes her uh, 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 simply more connected to the husband. It actually produces good. But if it's either too much that create damage or it's with somebody that's not your wife or someone that's, you know, or, or, or in an inappropriate uh, uh, way, what you're doing is you're taking a spiritual sustenance that HaKadosh Baruch is giving you and you're giving it to some zona. Yeah, but I love her. She's my girlfriend. Okay, let's see if you say that in six months from now when she ran off with the car, with the house, with everything else and somebody else too is driving that car and living in that house. Yeah, but I bought her that. Exactly. And even if you didn't buy that, all of a sudden you'll see that she's much more successful. All of a sudden you'll see that she left you, but somehow she struck it rich. She's has the she all of a sudden she's getting blessings from different ways. Guess what, Habibi? That was your blessing. You gave it to her. All of that seed wasn't just physical, there's a spiritual element to it. And that's why Batsheva tells her son, the companion of harlots will lose a fortune. A person that's with harlots is constantly with women he'll lose all of his money why because each time you do the act you're giving away your spiritual sustenance to that person and woe to you if she's not your wife because you're giving your sustenance to somebody that will call somebody else her man now what about a person that weighs seed? They're also going to lose everything. Why would they lose everything? Because it's still being wasted. That sustenance that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives a person is being wasted. He's not keeping it. And therefore, people that weigh seed have testified. And I've seen this literally with my own eyes. People will do this, would follow, watch the shoe, and then tell me exactly what happened. can't believe it rabbi i knew what you said but you know i have an urge i have this i said you know what i'm not gonna do with that girl but i still had the urge so i was with myself next day i wake up my stock account is down twenty thousand dollars is there any connection rabbi it's not just a connection it's a flashing red alarm from HaKadosh Baruch Hu that that's the reason. You took the sustenance that Hashem gave you for a momentary pleasure, it just cost you $20,000. Next time could be 50. Next time could be 100. Next time could be your entire business. Now, you think, oh no, okay, well at least I didn't waste it, it was with, with my girlfriend. Oh, okay, so you just gave it to her. Shlomo HaMelech's mother tells him, this type of stuff destroys kings, kings that are extraordinarily wealthy. Kings that chase women eventually end up broke. The Baal Atulim, who was one of the greatest geniuses that ever lived, he writes in his uh, commentary on the Torah, something unbelievable where in his commentary on the Torah uh, without a computer you know centuries before computers were even a thought he told you every single word that appears in the Torah every place that it appeared And he shows you how each and every single time, regardless of where it's mentioned, whether it's mentioned in the five books of Moses or it's mentioned a thousand years later in the prophets. That makes a difference. He shows you how every single time that word is mentioned, where it's mentioned without computers, but even more so how it's all connected. It's all saying the same exact thing. It's all part of the same lesson. 
And there's a sages that say that he wrote this commentary in one night. To read it in a month. It's a, I, I think only a, only a serious Torah scholars can do. He wrote it in a month. Now, the Baal Turim in Parashat Miketz, on chapter 41, verse 34, where it talks about how Paro realized that what Yosef was saying, how he interpreted the dream, was true, and he made him the viceroy, and now he put him in power to handle this whole up, you know, upcoming famine. And it says that Yosef Vaifkot Pekidim, that Yosef appointed overseers. He appointed different people to help him. Help him manage the uh, places to store the food. Help him with uh, manage the uh, you know the uh, different crops and so on. So the Bible to him says, where else does it say? that he appointed overseers oh it says so almost 1500 years later in Megillah Testel chapter 2 verse 3 Achashverosh also appointed overseers what's the connection says the Balaturim something beautiful he says look Shlomo HaMelech says, don't give your strength to women. Shlomo HaMelech says, if you spend time chasing after prostitutes, chasing after women, you're going to lose everything. We see what Shlomo HaMelech says in these verses. How? Look. Yosef at Tzadik, what did he do? He appointed overseers for what? For the benefit of society, to protect people, to collect food, to collect different things that are going to benefit everybody, to collect money. And what ended up happening? He became very wealthy. He became very blessed. And his blessing was enough to feed generations of his family. And the entire country of Egypt became the most powerful country in the world. On the other hand, he also appointed overseers for what to go find him a girl find him a new wife after he killed his wife go find him a different one let me try this one that one whether she's married or not doesn't make a difference bring her here what and what ended up happening to a he lost all of his money he lost all of his money so Says the Baal Turim, if you listen to Shlomo Melech, not only will you protect yourself physically, but you also protect your bank account. You protect yourself financially. So then the uh, Ramban says to us, But when the union is at a proper time, which is Shabbat night, which is in the, which is in a secret of complete cycle of front and back, as in the seven days of the week, then it can give strength to his mate, and he will not experience a loss that can weaken him, for he has already received strength from that which he can provide it. See, here the Ramban gives us an extraordinary secret. Not only a secret in regards to intimacy, but also secrets to Shabbat and the creation itself. Well, here he's telling you, the Torah scholars were told that they should be intimate with their wives aside from the obligatory days of Mikveh day and if they're before they leave to a long trip. They should be intimate on Shabbat. That's it. Now, your average person thinks that's insane. But the average Torah scholar 
This is great, fantastic. I'm going to try to do this. The Ramban says, there's a huge benefit to it. Why? If you do it this way, you're not only going to protect your body, like the Rambam says, but in essence, you're also going to gain strength as a result of it. You're not going to lose strength. Because this is part of the secret of the complete cycle front and back of the seven days a week where HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Obviously, HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't get tired. He didn't need to stop. But he wanted to teach us this specific lesson that there is a benefit to stopping in order to regather strength. And the main time to do that is on Shabbat. Now, if a person exerts themselves every day, including Shabbat, they never have enough time to re-energize. And instead of becoming more productive, instead of becoming more successful, they end up dead, sick, or both. Now, this is not only applicable in a person's life, this is applicable in the world today. There was a person that was an uh, expert in the uh, area of uh, botanism. He was a botanist that Rabbi Ephraim recently spoke to. And he says to Rabbi Ephraim, I can't believe how much wisdom there is in the Torah. He said, just last year, I learned about the extraordinary wisdom that's in the Shemitah of how it affects the land. Where all of these people that observed the Shemitah and in so many words didn't grow anything for a whole year, abandoned the ground for a whole year, you would think this would be bad. But if you follow what happened to that their land after the Shemitah was completed, you would literally see a natural miracle where all of the nutrients, all of the minerals, all of the things people pay a fortune came naturally to those grounds because they were able to rest. And now their ground is able to yield much more fruit than they were ever able to do before. Why? Because they stopped for that one year. Rafaim says to him, this, everything else you've learned and much more that you didn't learn about botanism is all part of our oral Torah in a section called Zra'im. Where we see in there that there is a mitzvah to not grow anything on the seventh year on the, on the Shemitah. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't just do it for that mitzvah so you can follow what he says. There's also a benefit you will be able to see with your own eyes of how the land becomes better as a result of you stopping for that one year. The same concept goes in a person's life. A person is active the whole week. He's lifting boxes. He's driving to different places. He's up, he's down, he's doing all types of things, he exerts his body. Now, if every day or several times a week, he's also exerting his body on an intimacy, then he's never going to have the ability to re-energize. He's never going to have the, re- the ability to improve himself, to rest, because all of his exertion at work is also coupled with the exertion with intimacy where all of the nutrients, all of the minerals, all of the seed that he needs to have strength and to improve and to stay healthy is constantly exerted, it's constantly spent. On the other hand, if he maintains himself and he waits for Shabbat, the Ramban says, not only will he not experience a loss that would weaken him, but he would actually give strength to his mate. These are two different things. 
He says the loss, he's not going to experience and, and weaken him. Why? Because he had the whole week to regain that strength. He exerted himself intimately on Shabbat. Now he acquired more strength, more of that seed throughout the week. So even though he exerted himself physically at work and whatever he did, that didn't affect the minerals and all of the things that are in his body. And therefore, by the next time to do it together, he's not going to experience that same weakness that your average person does, where sometimes they're intimate with their wife and they end up waking up late the next day or they're drowsy the next day or they get a cold or all types of things. Now, of course, this is, again, there's a... This doesn't happen every single time. So a person that's very promiscuous and say, no, no, I'm fine. Every day is fine. Fine. You could be fine. Long term, you see more of this stuff. Just like in any other experiment. Over the long run, you see the outcomes of these things. Much more than you do in the short run. But needless to say, that weakening that a person gets won't happen to you. Why? You had the whole week to regroup. You had the whole week to gather those parts that you've exerted in a, in a positive manner. But even more so, he says, it'll actually give strength to your mate. What does it mean, give strength to your mate? That because you're doing it in a holy way, because you're containing yourself, because you're doing it in, in such a fashion that Akadosh Baruch Hu says, you are practicing holiness not just speaking holiness not just saying that holiness is a good thing but you're practicing holiness your seed becomes holy and therefore when you share that holiness with your wife you empower her you actually empower your wife and you give strength to your mate you give strength to your wife now Therefore, says the Ramban, it said in the name of David Amelech, in uh, Tehilim chapter 1, verse 3, bring forth its fruit in its season, which is from Shabbat night to Shabbat night, and juxtapose within the verse, and whose leaves do not wither. That is to say that the union will be for the sake of heaven, and it will come to completion. So here we see that the Ramban is telling us again the same verse by David Melech and mentioning it by letting us know that David Melech already implied this teachings of sanctity between a man and his wife in the first tailing in these couple of verses but in fact The whole Tehilim is talking about it. In chapter 1, David Melech tells us praises of the man who walked not in the counsel of the wicked and stood not in the path of the sinful and sat not in a session of scorchers. Right off the bat, David Melech is telling us if your friends are those types of people that are fools that say that intimacy is simply to relieve themselves they're not able to contain themselves they just want to do whatever they want to do and you found new friends your new friend became the Ramban your new friends became the sages of Am Yisrael your new friends became Talmidei Chachamim that want to achieve holiness that's already you achieving praiseworthy and those people that are making fun of you one day they're going to ask you for blessings the next verse, David Melech says, but his desire is in the Torah of Hashem. In his Torah, he meditates day and night. person that is going to achieve holiness is only going to do that by having Torah in his mind. If a person has Oprah Winfrey and Netflix and sports and money and all that stuff on their mind at all times, they're never going to attain wealth spiritually. They're never going to attain sanctity. Now again, everybody in their own level, but certainly everybody can reach somewhere better than what they are right now. And then David Melech says the verse that is deeply rooted within this lecture where he says, he shall be like a tree 
deeply rooted alongside brooks of water that yields its fruit in its season and whose leaf never wither and everything that he does will succeed this is literally everything we spoke about today first David Melech tells us here that this person that follows the Torah follows these teachings of Kedusha runs away from the naysayers runs away from the people from society from all of the different negative influences whatever they do as far as their intimacy with their spouse will yield fruit in the right time in the right season but they're not just going to be fruits that are rotten fruits that have worms in it fruits that are missing body parts missing abilities missing iq points but rather they're going to be deeply rooted they're going to be ones that are the best of the best and in fact he himself will have a long life his fruits and whatever he does is not going to wither is not going to weaken the act of intimacy between him and his wife is not going to weaken him and not only that everything that he does will succeed meaning this is not only going to lead to successful children but also successful marriage happiness and successful when it comes to panasa meaning a person can live a piece of gan eden by attaining kedusha not so the wicked says david Menach. rather they are like the chaff that the wind drives away therefore the wicked shall not be vindicated in judgment nor the sinful in the assembly of the righteous for Hashem attends the way of the righteous while the way of the wicked will perish this is obviously self-explanatory where David Melech says everything we just said at the righteous that achieve sanctity the chase after sanctity the chase after Kedusha everything that they will get the wicked will not now you think that sometimes the wicked look like they're succeeding look he just bought a 10 million dollar house look he has this company look he has this look he has that he says look eventually it's going to wither eventually it's going to go away eventually it's going to fly with the wind eventually you'll see who was God with at all times and who just had the optical illusion of the Satan this too is another way that our sages teach us how beneficial it is to follow the Holy Torah but at the same token teaching us how much they cared about our joy our happiness in this world doing the things that you want to do doing the things that you need to do and in fact the Gemara in Masechet Baba Kama page 82a talks about the different takanot the def- 10 takanot that Ezra Sofer made one of them like I said was the Tvilat Keri this was later on removed because they saw that people couldn't uh, handle it another one was to the institution of reading the Torah on Mondays and Thursdays but another one of the takanot is something that's not a takana anymore but you can still do it and benefit says Ezra Sofer takana for the Chachamim to eat onion on Friday nights cooked onion not live onion because that will make you smell bad cooked onion whatever you wanted to have why make a takana to go to the mikveh make a takana to read the Torah a couple times a week so there's never three days more than three days that you're not reading the Torah but make a takana to eat onion why because if you're following the teachings of Kedusha says Ezra Sofer if you're teaching yourself to be holy and have a holy house and have holy children and have a holy wife then there should be more of you how can we be helpful in that regard eat onion that Friday eat why because that onion increases the sperm count 
So even that will become physically aligned with the spiritual part of it. Here we see how much love for Am Yisrael the sages have, where they care enough our joy, they care enough about our success, they care enough to give us the details of the details. Whether it's the details of how to keep kashrut, or how to achieve humility, or it's details of simply what to eat in order for us to have the things we want, which is the fruit of our efforts. Here we see Rabotai Karim, how great it is that we live in a generation where HaKadosh Baruch Hu made the Torah easily accessible to all those that are willing to hear it. Open your mouth and I'll fill it, Hashem says. If a person wants the truth, wants to achieve holiness, it's readily available to them for free. On the Be'ezrat Hashem app, on bh.live, and even on our YouTube channel. If you subscribe, and make sure to never miss a shiur. Please enjoy it, enjoy each other, achieve sanctity and i promise you you'll never have even a moment to regret other than the moments you aren't doing it but baruch hashem it's better late than never thank you again for learning with me thank you again for achieving a higher level of sanctity this week than we had last week bezat hashem will learn more about this topic on the kabbalistic aspect of it next week and tomorrow night, Bezat Hashem, we'll also talk about the questions and answers, the weekly parasha, Bezat Hashem. So, get ready for more Torah, but don't ever forget that these shiurim, they're not just a one-time thing. Sometimes they need to be reviewed a few times. Sometimes more than a few times. And sometimes, it's the one thing that you forgot that you need in order to achieve sanctity. Enjoy it, share it, and if you care enough to support it, we'd very much appreciate it. Call to Bachabat Lechah.